Welcome back, WNST, Towson, and Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are keeping calm. We are staying local, and we got something really special for you in this segment. Don Moeller and I have been getting together uh, every week or two since the beginning of the, uh, I keep calling it the pandemonium, the pandemic, the crisis. Uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, I, I want to brand it the Trump crisis, so I'm going to uh, begin it, the Trump pandemic. Uh, we're going to pin this one on him. Don Moeller, former Baltimore County executive, joins us now. Um, and we're welcoming something here that I know uh, you're very fond of, Ryan Miner. We're putting something together here on, on, on a sort of a mutual basis to sort of yell and scream a little bit and have a little bit of coffee on the porch and do what we do around here at Baltimore Positive, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I can tell you, and, and Ryan knows, and, and Ryan, welcome, welcome. A minor detail. Thank so you. It's a, it's a joint broadcast, Baltimore Positive and, and a minor detail. Ryan knows, we've joked about it before, that my – former boss, God rest his soul, Kevin Kamenitz, was a loyal reader of A Minor Detail long before it was podcast work, and uh, he would come into my office waving something that Ryan had written, so, uh, you know, Ryan, you, you've made a tremendous uh, reputation out there, you, you're one of the hardest working guys in journalism in the state, and now, like the rest of us, you're, you're working from home. Uh, real quick, before we uh, before we uh, invite you and have you comment, uh, let let us thank and you can do the same if you want, uh, Ryan. But let us thank our sponsors at uh, State Fair. Uh, still doing carryout, still doing curbside breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Give State Fair a call. They're working hard. They're one of the many small businesses trying to weather this storm. He won't give me the chicken recipe. I keep trying. Oh, man, the chicken and waffles. Ryan, you probably know that you're an oil listener. Mm. That Nestor has a thing about chicken Ryan, and waffles. Ryan, they put, they put jalapeno peppers in the waffles. <laughs> he loves the chicken and waffles. And I don't even like jalapeno peppers. I mean, like I don't like them at all, but there's something about it. So anyway, yeah. He also loves his uh, steam cra- uh, steam, uh, crab cakes rather from uh, from Fabies, our good friends, Danny Hahn and Bill and Nancy Devine. They're still shipping those crab cakes. Actually, mine... And the crab soup are supposed to arrive today. I cannot wait. I'm I would excited. ship the mac and cheese to my belly. Uh, yeah, you so. love the mac. Cool. You love the mac and I cheese. Would. I like the collard greens. So they got all kinds of good things. Just go on Fabies, hit the shop button, bring it right to your home. And then our good friends at Moeller and Gary Realtor, Jeff Moeller, they're doing real estate throughout this. They're doing virtual tours, you name it. So thanks to all of our sponsors. And welcome aboard, Ryan Miner. Hey, guys, I appreciate this, and I'm a big fan of Baltimore Positive. I've learned a lot, most importantly, from your program and emphasizing the the positive aspects of a city that uh, has gone through its ups and downs, but no less is still the central hub of the state of Maryland, a city that we have all grown to, to love and appreciate for its culture, for its people. I I can't thank you enough for emphasizing the good aspects and there's many positive things and this this whole coronavirus i think that once all of us marylanders get through this and even collectively as a country i think we're going to have i think we're going to look at life a little bit differently i am desperately yearning for person to person contact but and that's why i reached out to you guys i said hey listen uh do you guys you guys want to do something cuz i want to talk to my friends well, Ryan, your background in all of this, I mean, you've come to me in the political space the last couple of years for all the people that told me to stay, stick to sports and stay in my lane and all the various FUs that I've received in the last couple of years in talking about this. There, there are no more sports for me, right? So the only sport is what's this maniac going to say at 6 o'clock tonight and how's it going to affect us? What's Larry Hogan saying at 11 o'clock every morning and how does it affect us? We're obviously going through the deepest, darkest week of all of this in the middle of all of this. Give me your background on how many, so many people People find you and, and and when I think of Hogan and I think of covering the state house and I think of our day together with the Maryland Hospital Association of all things uh, eight weeks ago and I shared a, a video that Damien O'Darty I saw shared about the Maryland Hospital Association how these heroes are now out on the front line but we're seeing real leadership here and we're seeing fake leadership here and it's pretty obvious to know the difference I think if you're paying attention but for you you've become sort of this go-to guy for a lot of people to try to 
sort of you know settle what, what you know what's coming out of what side and who's trying to get what done in Annapolis and who's lobbying for what and where the money's coming from. But your background in all of this for for all of your followers, I mean, you, you were podcasting before we we're podcasting around here, Ryan, right? I've been doing this podcast since April, or yeah, actually January of 2015. Wow. And I said, I started out just in Western Maryland because that's where I was born and raised. And then uh, my wife and I settled in on Montgomery County, where I am now. And then I started taking on state politics and I got heavily involved in writing and broadcasting through the podcast format back in 2018 when the gubernatorial election was occurring and look I'm I'm a young guy I'm I'm figuring out politics I was a political science major and then I decided that I really was someone who valued the the sharing of truthful information and that's why I have tried to channel myself into an independent thinking uh, uh blogger podcaster journalist whatever you want to call me uh, I, I wear many hats just like you and Don do but I am here because I like to decipher the facts and cut through the the BS, just like you do, Nestor and Don, and give it give the story straight. I think Marylanders deserve to be told the truth without a lot of partisan angling, and we have seen that through the years. And we watch the news, and we say, "What is who is really telling us the truth? Is it just somebody who we turn on the channel? You know, for people who like the president, they'll turn on Fox, and if they don't like the president, they might turn on." MSNBC or or or, or uh, the CNN. So, you know, with podcasting, I think at a local level, what we're doing, I think we really can cut to the chase pretty quickly because we know the players. Don, I mean, heck, the, the former county executive, you were um, the chief of staff to, to to the late wonderful Kevin Kamenetz, and we, you know how politicians operate. You know how state politics operate. And here I am today. I'm sitting in front of. I'm sitting at my home. I'm talking to to you guys on uh, this medium. And if we can share information in a way that is constructive, that is positive, of course we're going to upset people. Nestor, I see it every time. You put out a fact, and then you get a bunch of people just say, "Buddy, stick to sports." And to me, that's and you know what? When I stuck to sports, uh, I put out a fact on a Monday morning, and somebody knows more than the coach. So you know, I, I that's why I sort of stopped taking phone calls back in two thousand and five. And you know, through through journalism and through Don's leadership and my relationship, I mean, Don will tell you going back fifteen years ago that the reason I stopped taking phone calls is just it was just stupid. You know what I mean? It was just it just wasn't good radio. It wasn't a good conversation. It wasn't an intelligent conversation. And, you know, I took myself off the air for nine years. And when I came back, I said, I'm only going to have sense. I mean, you can disagree with me, but you can't tell me the moon is made of green cheese. You know, if that's your premise, we don't have a conversation anymore. We have a farce. We have the WWE. And sports fans and professional wrestling fans and good guy, bad guy fans and red hat, blue hat fans. Don, I know that that's something that's maddening to you. You deemed it cultish long before I did any of this. Um, And certainly what's been brewing in American politics, and I know you wrote about it on the porch, uh, you know, in regard to Newt Gingrich and the modern politics that we now see with our lives on the line. Guys, we're a month in our own homes. You can't hug your grandchildren, Don, you know? No, it's, it's, it's interesting. And you two are, as I say, I'm a, I'm a recovering uh, politician. You guys are <laughs> the, uh, the, the journalists among us. I, I think this search for truth, and, it, and it's so interesting that both of you talk about it. Both of you get pushed back from time to time from folks on this push for truth. Uh, Nestor, you certainly you, you get worked up. You get, you know, you really get energized by what we're seeing. And I guess the thing, and I'll ask both of you as journalists, and I, it's the big question to me, is can we have a real discussion about whether or not the networks, and it's not the major networks, obviously they're not, doing it on the on the regular NBC, ABC, CBS stations, Fox, but on the cable channels, the CNNs, the Fox, the MSNBCs, should they continue to carry 
these daily briefings by the president. I actually was in the car yesterday for almost two hours, so I was I was captive pretty much, and I listened to yesterday. You know, I hope that was essential briefing. things you were doing. I'm just checking. I mean, I'm it checking for essential. Larry. I never got, never even got out of the car, but I pretty much didn't get out of the car. And when I did get out of the car, there was no one else around. So it was a total social distancing uh, event. But my, my and my poor wife, who literally, when we're home, having to watch the briefings, typically will leave the room, go in and put her headphones on, read a book, do something else, because she literally can't abide this failure to address the truth. And and I ask each of you as journalists, what's your take on a situation? And I don't care what day people are listening to this. We know that the day before or that day, the president will deny what he said the day before and say that he never said it, despite the fact that there is tape there. And despite the, and we know also that that forty percent, and it goes somewhere between. It's not going anywhere different. It's it's going to be somewhere between thirty eight percent and forty four, forty five percent of the American public are going. I'd like to, to meet those believe. people. By the way, who the hell wakes up today and says yes, and then tomorrow says no, and on Friday say he's changed his tone when he's reading a book report that he didn't write, and it's obvious that he's never read. Like, you know, he's reading it like a fifth grader would read a textbook that they've never read. It's Well, let's, let's ask Ryan, Nestor, because, you know, people hear us. We, we go on and on. They know how frustrated we get. Uh, but, Ryan, you're, you're down there. You're in Montgomery County. Uh, you're talking to, uh, you know, a different group of folks than we are. You're trying to make sense of it. Uh, as we come together digitally here today, what's your sense on what is happening journalistically, and what is this hold that the president has on this roughly forty percent? What's what's your take as a journalist? Well, first of all, we talked about the the president and the mistruths. The the first problem that. I have with the media is we are afraid to we are afraid to call it a lie. The president is a liar. He lies every day, and we have to come to terms with that. Otherwise, what is the profession of journalism? It is calling out the facts and holding power accountable. And if we can't call out the president for lying, then journalists simply are not doing their jobs. And I, I see these press conferences, and like you, Don, and probably like you, Nestor. I, 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 I can't, I just can't, I just Well, I also, can't. Ryan, I've been around this a long time, and Don and I fight about this. Who's in the room? And, yeah. and, and why are they there, and what is their access, and what is their ability to stand up and say, you're a third-rate president? Because that's what I would do at a president. I mean, I would be thrown out of there. Well, that would I, I would be thrown out of there, argue. but I wouldn't be allowed in there. You know what I mean? I would argue with you. Here, this is where I mean, i got a baseball owner that doesn't let me in. So You know what I'm saying? Got, so, we've, it, got three, we've got three folks here, and we have a lot of agreement. We're going to have some disagreement, which, is, which hopefully wouldn't make That's fine. Worth listening to. Uh, I hope we do. I would say to you that that would be totally unproductive to stand up and say you're a third-rate president. What I would suggest that should happen, and I and Ryan, I think this gets to your point. On a recent press conference, when one of the reporters asked the president about the recent report study from uh, HHS, which showed that in a, an interview with 300 hospitals across the nation that those hospital folks, those, the personnel in those hospitals, were extremely stressed and extremely frustrated, even at this moment, by the lack of supplies. Now, the president immediately went on the attack, called the reporter stupid, called the reporter uh, a, a, you know, a fake, as he always does, and refused and then attacked the inspector general of that division, because they had worked in the Obama administration, even though, and again, I remind the folks that are the Trump supporters, even though this particular inspector general, gets back to your point, Ryan, about facts, had been reappointed as recently as this January, January 2020, 
by the Trump administration, but attacks this person and, and makes it a joke. What I don't understand, and it's not saying you're a third-rate president, and you guys react to this as journalists, what I don't understand is why there's not a code before they go in that room that when that happens, that the very next reporter, to me, should go back and say, Mr. President, if I can revisit that, I want to ask again, I want to build on that question, what do you say to these 300? And keep asking it, and you can be polite until he either ends the conference or walks out of the, and walks out of the room. But it seems to me that there ought to be a code of conduct among those reporters that we will repeat that question one after another until we get an answer as to why HHS just found out that these 300 hospitals are extremely frustrated. Well, yeah, I'd like you both to weigh in on that. It's a, at, on, it's a great point that, that journalists do, I, and I see it more and so every day, where they are pushing back against him at press conferences. Just yesterday we saw the, fame, the, the, the in, inscrutable uh, and irreplaceable Jonathan Carl from ABC News, who is the, the, just the apex of his career, a journalist, journalist, a newsman, questioning the president, and the president is lashing out because he cannot withstand the facts. And it goes beyond Don and Nestor, beyond the, the politics, and it's his shtick to, to attack the press. We're, we're talking about somebody who is, there's, there's a serious psychosis. I, we've seen an umpteen reports with him. This is a man who cannot stand to be criticized in any way. He is a, clearly a, a sociopathic personality. He's a narcissist. And he cannot comprehend anything that does not conform to his, his thought process. And it's dangerous because we're working with people who are being led by someone who just absolutely lies to them every day. And in turn, what's more frustrating and just maddening is that we see these people defend him knowing deep down that they have to believe that this guy is wrong. They just like what he is saying. And it all comes down to how can we own the other side instead of put together practical policy solutions. But, guys, we're here. Let's just count the number of ways that the government has failed us. He lied about, he first downplayed the coronavirus. Then he sent mixed messages, right? And then they saw the virus and reacted to it and talked about it from an immigration and travel border issue rather than a public health perspective. He attacked the, the governor from Washington, Michigan. I mean, we're talking about petty stuff in the middle of a crisis. But I think at the it's core not- of this, Ryan, the question would be in January and February, does he have the intellectual capability and or curiosity to even understand what a virus is, what a pandemic could be, what it would do to the markets, you know, what it's going to do to the stock market. You know, that would be all he would care about, obviously, following the narrative over the last five years where he's been in my living room every day. The question would be, when smart people, when scientists, when every day on his daily briefing in January, virus, Wuhan, pandemic, Listen to our scientists. Where, where are we on this? What is our pandemic preparation? Where is our pandemic team? I don't think when he was watching a football game in January on a weekend or golfing or having one of his hate rallies up in Hershey or wherever that he really even understands what a pandemic is. I mean, fundamentally, I don't believe he's capable of understanding it enough to cover it up. You know, I mean, I, I don't, well, you, you well, know, well, and, well, and it's sort of like a child, like like a seventh grade kid being handed this problem and saying there is no bacteria, there is no virus, there is no China, it won't come here, where are my toys? You know, that well, that's what it felt like to me. Well, I, and, and to make your point, Nestor, that, that is a, a, a and I, I can hear, I, I know that uh, <laughs> friends and neighbors who are, as I call it, member of the Trump team or the Trump, Trump cult, you know, they're, they're, they're turning this off uh, right and left, and, and that's okay, because as you said, we're going to continue. Well, I always that say that I, I, maybe I'm the last stuff. person on their timeline that will still tell them the truth. If I'm the last person in your world speaking this language to you, 
my God. That's all I can say. You know what I mean? Well, let, let's, let's, let's think about a minute what you just said and going back to what Ryan said about there, there being lies. And, and I'm going to suggest that on one major issue that is debunked daily, it may be a lie, but I'm not sure that it's not his lack of understanding. And again, folks, if you get angry at me, remember, he's the one. He's the one that brags that he's never read a book. It's not Don Moeller saying the president's never read a book. He's proud of the fact that he's never read a book. I believe in terms of testing, which we know is still the great failing in the United States of America, that when he goes out there every day and talks about an irrelevant number, that number being the total number of tests, the 1.8 million tests more than anyone else, which is an irrelevant number, and that the only number that matters is how many tests you're giving per capita to get an apples-to-apples comparison with other nations. He refuses and obviously says to reporters they're stupid again and they're mean, and why are you asking that? When they ask him about the per capita comparison, which puts us way behind other countries like South Korea, China, and others, it puts us way behind... I am convinced, I've said this to my wife repeatedly, I truly don't think he understands per capita. Therefore, when, when they ask that, and, and we all have known, folks, that when you feel that someone is asking you something and it makes no sense to you because you don't understand it, you tend to get defensive and lash out. So my sense is, is that he doesn't, understand per capita, along with his inclination, Ryan, as you said, to not, not inclination, again, he's verbalized it from the podium, to accept no responsibility for our late response. It, not only that, Don, I, I think he's a fundamentally dumb guy. I, I do. and I, I, I agree with that. Knows, I, I, I've I watched the parade like you have. <laughs> I, for, for years, we have seen this. And there, is, there is no illusion anymore that the curtain has been unfolded and unwinded and unfurled. We see exactly who he is. There was never a grandiose businessman behind this. This is a guy who has failed at virtually everything that he has done. He refuses to release his tax returns because we know that he's not a rich guy. He doesn't read. He brags and boasts that he doesn't read. He doesn't read his briefings. He doesn't read his intelligence reports. He believes that he is smarter than his generals. This is a guy that is consumed in his, in his, by his own idiocy, and they, they, they use this as a partisan weapon, this anti-intellectualism that somehow the left is, you know, they think that they're smarter and better. Well, the fact is it's not about left or right. It's just that the president of the United States is a truly dumb guy. And, and we have to say, it. there's no grand business guy, man behind this thing. We all said, well, we'll give him a chance. He knows what he's doing. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's yeah. failed at everything that he has done in his life, and we made this guy the leader of the free world. Well, I, well the I Gary Kasparov right. point, I, I want to read this because – at the beginning of this, we were talking about truth, we were talking about journalism, I pulled this thing up, uh, Gary Kasparov, of course, the, the famous uh, uh, chess player and uh, uh, Russian expat, the point of modern propaganda isn't only to misinform or push an agenda, it is to exhaust your critical thinking to annihilate truth, and the more of the Fox lines I see and the more of all of the propaganda of all of it that began with Rush Limbaugh and my aunt in San Diego 20 years ago when I used to go visit her and hear this stuff and think, who the hell would ever think that's true? Um, and 20 years later, apparently 40% of America, because the, the myths, truths that, that, are, that are out there every day at 6 o'clock, they are the talking points that he hears on Morning Fox News. And to your point, when would there be any time to read when all he does is watch TV and tweet to it? Literally. I mean, we, we can follow that much of his life and his lifestyle on a timeline, literally, right? You, you know what's most infuriating, and you're exactly right, Nestor, and Don, and you know what's most infuriating is that his supporters, who we would consider some of them to be real people, we know them. We know it. It could even be our own family members. Correct. Oh, and like, people, in, in mine, it can be. <laughs> and, and, I mean, welcome to Western Maryland. 
And we know that there are some really good and decent people at heart who are still back him. And you have to look at them. And if you sit down with them and you sort of unwind the last three and a half years, the lies, the just the nonsense, the, 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 the dribble, the attacks, the tweets, and you really get to the bottom of it with these people and you talk to one-on-one with them and you start to, to make some sense, it seems like they just have this innate ability to no matter what, defend him. And it's like, well, you know, the president has 22 cases of legitimate sexual assault, uh, uh, you know, allegations against him. Uh, well, what about, what about, what about? What about, and what about everyone? Does. Brian, I think that is rich. a critical, critical point. For those of you just joining in, this is a joint, uh, having a lot of fun, joint broadcast between Ryan and I'm Ryan not having any fun. I'm not having any fun at all. <laughs> and a Baltimore positive, we're trying to keep Nestor medicated. I want I want to come back to Ryan's point there about the folks that we know, family and relatives, who continue to blindly support this person. And I wrote about this. And Nestor, thanks for giving a shout out to uh, the blog. If you if you want to read the, my recent blogs on the front porch, it's uh, donmolwer dot com. Please check them out. And I wrote one. A, a few issues back about what it is and how I boiled it down to what he has mastered is that old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And what Trump recognized, I believe, is that there are really a handful of issues that folks feel aggrieved about in our nation, and they've been there for decades, decades and decades, and that if he could throw some kerosene on the fire, he could ignite that 40% to win a very, very narrow victory. To me, those issues, and they continue to come front and forward. It is number one, for a large percentage of them, I will say as many as 30 to 35% of that 40 to 45 that he captures. It's the issue of abortion. It's Roe v. Wade and judges. I have a number of family members who every other issue be damned as long as they have a president in their eyes who will appoint judges who will overturn Roe v. Wade. They're really willing to look everything else and put it aside. The second issue is, I believe, if they have a president who they believe gives two diddlies about their right to the Second Amendment and ability to have assault weapons, forget the fact that 90% of Americans support background checks, that 90% of Americans support common sense gun legislation, that 90% of Americans don't think that folks who've committed domestic violence should have access to firearms. They don't care as long as he can convince them that the other side is coming for their guns, then he will stand with them. And then, of course, the third issue and the one that very often I put number one, and this is the one that guys will drive those who don't who don't agree with us, this is the one that puts them right over the edge because they personalize it. And that is, in my heart, I believe Donald Trump is the greatest dog whistler of all time in terms of race and people who don't look like us. And you put those three things together, the abortion, the guns, and the others, and you have a perfect stew for this a kind of uh, populist candidate who can make people think that everybody else just doesn't get them and everybody else are elite snobs, and then you end up with a Donald Trump. And as you said, Ryan, my guess is you've had many, many conversations with friends and relatives in Western Maryland, and they're simply not going to budge, right? Uh, they won't. But they, they will hear you out. They will be courteous and respectful be, and take away social media because that's a whole other platform that gives people a license to be a jerk because they're not looking you face-to-face. But they, they, no, they're not going to budge. They think no. Trump is doing a great job. And 
they're being they're only reading information which reinforces their personally held beliefs. Ryan Miners here. He is a minor detail, and of course, Don Mulder, former Baltimore County executive. We're doing a, a sort of a mixed marriage here of, uh, of of two podcasts and one radio station. We are WNST.net, Taos in Baltimore. We're keeping calm. We're staying local, and we're staying Baltimore positive. Don, you set Ryan up for an incredible transition here because you you mentioned these three big issues, and you'd say, well, let's see, you know, uh, uh, Roe v. Wade, okay, um, not a fringe issue, but certainly uh, not a majority issue in this country for sure um you 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 mentioned guns uh something both sides would say yeah we might want to have those and protection and yeah you know constitution we will go through all of that that's cool now whether do we want ak-45 15s and assault rifles or uh should everyone have machine guns or are are we talking about hunting animals are we talking about protection of my home And, and then then you talk about race politics but the the, 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 the concoction of all of that now is what we saw in Wisconsin on Tuesday. And Ryan, I know you want to go on on this, which is voter suppression, which is how we get a an absolute deliverance nincompoop in Georgia installed as a governor in a, an election where there was incredible voter suppression, who then says in the middle of a pandemic that's killing a thousand people a day, Oh, we just realized yesterday that, like, it's contagious. Um, it's, it's really an amazing thing, and Wisconsin's right up on it this week with voter suppression, and we have our own issues here in Maryland where I'm in the 7th, Kwaise's running, uh, the, 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 the woman he's running against can't get signs on lawns because you're not allowed to leave the house, and, you know, Ryan, we're in the middle of this, right? Like, the, the voter suppression issue in Wisconsin, that's 49 other states' issue at some point, and we've already moved our election here once, and I, the, the notion that I'm going to go out with rubber gloves and a mask in five weeks and pull my lever for any of these mayoral candidates that we've had on our program. Uh, we're in sort of a precarious situation where Wisconsin set a tone that's not a very good tone here this week. Well, to, to your point, Nestor, uh, to, first to Wisconsin, and then I want to bring it back home, that we're talking about the Wisconsin Supreme Court, they overturned the executive order that was issued by the Democratic governor, Terry Evers, uh, to delay the in-person voting until June uh, until June 9, followed by the U.S. Supreme Court order on Monday evening to cut off an extension for absentee voting. And let's look at what and who is on the Supreme Court. Brett Kavanaugh is on the Supreme Court because Donald Trump nominated him. Someone who was accused of sexual assault by a legitimate person who came to testify and is now on the Supreme Court because a few Republicans and Joe Manchin could not come up and, and uh, uh, the other one um, up in Maine um, could not come to a reasonable conclusion that this is a bad guy who shouldn't be on the Supreme Court. Now let's move over to the 7th District. Uh, looking at this race between Kwaeze and Fume and his opponent, Kim Klasik, I've interviewed Ms. Klasik. I've, I've not had the chance to interview um, the, the former congressman. If we have, so Ms. people can check. If they want to check them out, they can, they can check out your interview, and then they can jump to Baltimore Positive and pull up our interview with uh, the former congressman Kwaeze and Fume. So they got them both. Well, and and I exactly, and Ms. Klasik, Mrs. Klasik, uh is seemingly taking credit for reducing the backlog in Baltimore City, uh, based on her videos in which she went out last September and basically blamed Elijah Cummings, who was near death, uh, on the problems that ails Baltimore City. Then she got attention from the president. Fox News had her on, and they put her on. At you know some <laughs> on Fox and Friends in the morning as a political commentator, she calls herself a journalist. Uh, it's up to the voters to decide uh, what they think, and you can listen to my interview with her. But there's there's is there really a policy platform for for Mrs. Klasik? Is she really resignating? I mean, look, we know. Let's be honest, guys, and we all and you guys are. She's not going to win this race. What she is, is she not doing? going to win. Correct. I mean, it's going to be a joke. It's quiet. I mean, he's he's not even mentioning her name, nor should he. And if there was, he should not even entertain standing on the debate stage. Because why? He's been a a congressman 
and who, who hasn't been perfect but still has looked down for the district, and then you have someone who is running on a Trumpian platform inside of the city of Baltimore who doesn't live in the district and who's expected people to, expecting people to vote for her based on her support, her basically her nonstop support for President Trump. She doesn't understand the district. She doesn't understand Maryland politics. She's been attacking Governor Larry Hogan. And what does she really want out of this? Does she want attention? Fine. She's got a little bit of it. We're talking about her. But when she goes away and nobody remembers her, if she's just going to go, what, is she going to just go back to Fox and pretend like uh, that she has some big, impressive platform? Come on. Well, now it's, it's, we are in, in uncharted territories as we talk about voting, and particularly as we move toward November. I, I think it's really a, a frightening time. The, the Wisconsin decision is an example. Ryan, as you allude to, both Supreme Courts, Supreme Court in Wisconsin, and then the United States Supreme Court uh, both ruled that they uh, sided with uh, the Republican Party in that state against the governor. I think I think there are some things that there are some alarm bells there as well. And and I understand that it's a complicated issue when you look at the composition of courts. But when ruling after ruling in the modern age continues to come down simply on party lines, I think that does shake the confidence of people in the United States of America in terms of its judiciary, which is supposed to be impartial. Now, I recognize that a little bit of la-la land, and there's always some politics all the way back to when Roosevelt tried to pack the court. There's always politics in the judiciary, but it's reached a level that's really pretty frightening. And this voting issue, Nestor, you rightfully called it out as, as voter suppression, is really, really critical. And again, not my words, folks. This is, this is not Don Moeller putting words into the president's mouth, but recently on Fox and friends, in the morning, the president went on and said very, very clearly that if we make voting easier, Republicans are not likely to win elections. I mean, it, 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 it's pure and simple why in every state that in terms of the two parties, Democrats look to expand the electorate, Republicans look to shrink it. And there are a number. There are a number of reasons for that. There's a. There's some. The the, the Knight Foundation, uh, K N I G H T, recently did the, the most expansive study ever in history on those who don't vote. And as we know, there are roughly 100 million Americans who don't vote. And the, the that's a hell of a pool, isn't it? I mean, in a year like this, right. where well, you know what I know about 100 million Americans that don't vote. Every single one of them has had their life unraveled in the last four weeks. Every si- well, without a doubt, Nestor. And this 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 study and folks can go on and check it out. It's, called, it's the Knight Foundation. It's called the One Hundred Million Project. It's it's the largest study ever of folks who don't vote in the United States, and it's it's fascinating, and it's fascinating in a couple of ways because what it shows is that while the common the common wisdom and the common thinking is is that if all those folks vote, it's automatically a plus for Democrats. Their detailed study shows not necessarily that these folks feel disenfranchised, but they break pretty closely along party lines. But, but let me tell you the takeaway that I took from this study. One of the things this study found, and this won't surprise any of us, is that these folks generally are, and think about this in terms of the president again, that the, this 100 million folks generally are distrustful of government, believe that everybody's in it for themselves, that they, 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 they just are angry at both political parties. Now, the reason, and that, that, that goes beyond whether they identified as potential D's, potential R's, or potential independents. But think about that. Distrustful, both political parties think the system doesn't work, think the system is rigged. I'm going to suggest to you that Steve Bannon and others, because the president wouldn't have been sharp enough to figure and put all of this together, that Bannon and others had similar polling data. And they knew that if Trump 
could motivate just a significant, a, a small portion, not a significant portion, a small portion of that faith to believe that he was the guy. And what's the word, fellas? What was he going to do when he was elected? This is a quiz. What was his word at those rallies? He was going to drain the swamp. The swamp. And he build the drain the swamp and build the wall. So if I can convince this group that I'm going to drain the swamp and they're all a bunch of crooks and you need me, Donald Trump, to fix it. And only I enough, can fix it. I can put together enough of an electorate, enough of a minority of electorate to allow me to win. And well, those certainly those. weren't people that were going to run out to vote for Mitt Romney or Chris Christie three and a half Correct. years ago. Yeah. Correct. So I, I'm, I'm going to suggest that the president may indeed be misreading part of those tea leaves that even though he was able to energize that base the first time to get out and win this small victory, the suggestion that by expanding the electorate automatically favors Democrats, that's the common wisdom. I'm not sure it's 100 percent correct, but beyond that, it seems odd to me that that there's a political party in the United States of America that wants to hang its hat on limiting who votes. What's your take on that, Ryan? I agree, and the president has said it himself. He has been, uh, he has not been shy about <laughs> voter suppression. And if things don't go his way, he actually makes up things, like when he said that what thousands of people came over the border from Massachusetts and voted in New Hampshire. That was an abject lie. That it, it didn't happen. That was a absolute lie. And if he can prevent people of color, people who are college educated and beyond uh people in major urban cities from not voting then my guess is is that he can continue to sustain the base of people that he has now and win with that and look it this this election could come down to a couple of obscure precincts or counties in wisconsin and that could be the election Right. I well, the fascinating part of this is when oh. Alabama catches the new flu, and in June they bury, oh, I don't know, forty thousand Alabamans. You know what I'm saying? And and that would be all of his people. That you would think, well, maybe that would flip Alabama, and it wouldn't, right? So he has. It's a zero sum game for him to some degree because these red states that are still running wild this week and spreading the fever, um, we, where governors don't even understand the virus itself and what asymptomatic even means, right? That you would say they will blame it on China. They will blame it on Obama, right? Like the, he can't lose in those states no matter how bad the pandemic gets, right? Well, Alabama, no, no. Go ahead, Ryan. I'm sorry. I, I was going to mention just very briefly, Alabama, we're talking about there was a small percentage of people who almost made – Roy Moore, a United States senator, right. Moore. and there was a question of, is this really going to happen? Uh, and thank God the people awoke in 2017 and said, we can go as far as Donald Trump, but we're not going to go as far as allowing a man to become a United States senator who was literally tossed out of being a mall and, and a shopping mall in his 30s for prying on young girls. No, there, listen, they're, they're, they, and again... Go back to my go back to my point a few minutes ago. For those folks, it was that they would they they would point to again. They would point to abortion, guns, abortion, guns. I mean that's that's what that's what they 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 come back to those issues and 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 they always come front and center. But there are I think this time and this this race this presidential race will will change uh, 15 or 20 times be- between now and, the- and November when we get to the election. But keep in mind that there are a couple of canaries in the coal mine. Num- number one, in the most recent poll, and the polls I, I recognize this for, I don't mean a whole lot, but Vice President Biden today is leading President Trump 46 to 40 in Florida. Now, I realize doesn't mean a lot at this point in time, but I do know this, that without Florida, I think it's very, very difficult to put together an electoral map for Donald Trump. I think the fact of the changing demographics in Arizona put Arizona, you know, clearly 
make it a difficult state for the president. And I think Stacey Abrams' work for voter registration and fighting voter suppression in Georgia actually may bring Georgia into play. So this election is going to change a lot between now and then. But I think we all need to keep our eye and that's what you, you, you know, we need to hold a light to it. Ryan, you need to. We need to get our friends, uh, Tom Cole and Candace Fouch and Reed at Elevate Maryland. All of us need to be focusing on this voter suppression issue because this election and the future of our nation may indeed come down to that. As, 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 as Biden has said repeatedly, one term of Donald Trump is an aberration. You'll be able to recover. Hey. Two terms of Donald Trump will change the arc of this nation for decades to come, and I believe that. Hey, Don, if you want to do something this summer uh, for Baltimore Positive, we should be registering people to vote around here. We can go back to touching people again. Ryan, anything uh, you want to like put the little cherry on the top of the first yeah. ever Baltimore uh, Positive uh, minor detail, which now, you know, it's bigger than a minor It's a minor detail plus, I guess, at this point. It's minor and major well, keys you're in, right? This is cool, and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to talk with me today, and it's nice to, to talk amongst friends about issues that we're passionate about. Yes, the one final issue that I wanted to put out on the table is that Senator Sanders has run a, a good race. He has, he, he, he has a sparked a lot of unique voters to come out and be part of the process for which I am thankful. Now, it is time for Senator Sanders to drop this fantasy and get behind Biden so they can unite the party now, not later, and go on and do what they need to do to take back the country from America's worst president in history. Well put, and we'll leave it at that because, you know, I've been positive about Bernie. I've been positive about Biden. I was positive about Elizabeth Warren. I liked Elizabeth Warren. I'll tell you when I wanted Elizabeth Warren, when I was on the hold with uh, Wells Fargo for three hours on, on Monday, I wanted Elizabeth Warren to be my president that, during that period of time. I promise you that. And, you know, I, she didn't win. You know what I mean? Bernie, you didn't win. You know, you, you, there, there comes a point where Biden wasn't my number one pick, but guess what? Uh, I'll be there with bells on to vote against the orange guy. So, uh, well, and, and, I, and I will be bringing anybody that wants to come along to register to vote along with me because I think that's going to be my pet project this summer, Don Mole. No, I, I think, it, I think it, 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 it's, it's critical to the future of the nation. I think we will – and I have one other quick point, Nestor, before we all uh, run and, and uh, move on to other projects today. But um, I think we'll see Bernie recognizing that reality here in the near future uh, – as you begin to read the tea leaves, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that along with the president, Bernie's energy really came from these large rallies where his devoted faithful would come. And, and I tip my hat to anyone, any of us who've been in that arena, anyone who can generate that kind of enthusiasm, I, I tip my hat to the Bernie folks. But I think he reads the tea leaves. It's, it's time to come together. I think, listen, I think there's an X factor here. And, you know, God willing, the the vice president will be healthy all through the process, but maybe we get together again in the near future and talk talk about the the rising star that is Andrew Cuomo. I mean, it's been absolutely amazing to watch what he's done day after day. I'd say Larry Hogan as well. Don't forget him. Oh, Larry Hogan, Andrew Cuomo, Gavin Newsom. I mean, the the governors and the big county executives like Johnny O across the nation. They've, they've just been. Remarkable. The last point, Nestor, for you and Ryan, and Ryan, I'm curious if you're going to do more on this topic. Um, it's just starting to come to light, and recently the president got very angry again when asked about it at one of the press conferences. I, I will tell you that I had a chat recently with, uh, I won't say which one, but the CEO of one of the smaller banks in the state of Maryland who is absolutely pulling his hair out over the incompetence of the administration in getting this small business, the small business loans out. I, I'm that guy, by the way. By, by the way, I'm the small business guy okay. who's had well, all my partners you. shuttered. Yes, that's well, me. Let me tell you what this person said. And this is a Republican that I'm talking to. This is a person who, although we didn't get into politics, my guess is it's a person who voted for Donald Trump three years ago. This person told me that they had 1,000 applications since the program began recently. 
they were only able to get out of the 1,000. Now, again, this Republican banker, pro-Trumper, one loan process out of the 1,000. And that the guidelines and the parameters were so confusing that no one at Treasury understood them, no one in the banking industry understood them, and they literally were at a standstill in trying to get this money. You know what I'm going to do? Both. Ryan and I, will leave it on this, Don, so I, I, I can not have your head explode like scanners. Ryan and I will apply for a press pass down at the White House, and I'm sure by the end of the week we'll get to go ask the president himself. I'm sure he can explain it all, right? I'd love to see you guys in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Appreciate you guys. I know time's a little short, and uh, Ryan, we'll do this again soon, man. And uh, plug away at, at, at uh, tell everybody how to find uh, your podcast if they're watching from our podcast. Sure, I'm all over the the place. iTunes, uh, a minor detail podcast, uh, a minor detail podcast dot com. Uh, I'm on virtually every podcast outlet, so it's, I'm easily to be found. A very available individual. That's for my sports fans there. And, Don Moeller, Baltimore the Positive. Ball, and that's for the same with Baltimore Positive, right? Wherever you get your podcast or Baltimore Positive. Nestor, what do you say about our sponsors before we're out of here? We've got to give some love to State Fair. I'm going to get over there. Evan, please send the chicken recipe if you can't just send the chicken and the waffles and the shrimp and the grits. Of course, our friends at Fadley's. You can ship Fadley's crab cakes anywhere. We hear uh, uh, Ryan's folks out in Western Maryland. You're one click away. Tomorrow afternoon, you got Fadley's crab cakes, world famous. They ship them everywhere. And of course, our friends at Moeller and Gary. And, and Don did not plug this, but I will. Uh, his son, Jeff Moeller, a guest on WNSD in Baltimore Positive this week at AM 1570. You can find that in our buyatoyota.com audio vault. For Ryan, for Don, I'm Nestor. We are WNSD.net, AM 1570. We're keeping calm. We're staying local. And we are always Baltimore Positive.